morning, everyone. All right. So just a few I have housekeeping uh, items before we start. Um, if there's anyone in the room with the media, can you please identify yourself? Okay, great. Um, we also want to thank our sponsors. Um, obviously, their generous support is why we're here. So today, um, uh, thank you guys for coming, obviously. Um, our session is titled Creating Exciting Attractions by Making Spaces Immersive, Experiential, and Sensory. Um, in, the, in the attractions business, we know that every experience matters, and the creating entertainment and wow inducing spaces for our guests is no easy task. Today, you're going to gain insight into some of the latest and greatest examples of immersive, sensory, and experiential design for attractions. You're going to learn through uh, real-world examples how exciting and engaging design can be used to create some of the most memorable spaces and guest experience for all types of attractions. I'd like to take a moment to introduce our panel of amazing speakers today. Um, first, we have Scott Lucas. Scott's a researcher, anthropologist, YouTube documentarian, former theme park trainer, author who specializes in immersive worlds, theming, and cultural remaking. He receives a PhD in cultural anthropology at Rice University and has taught anthropology and sociology at Lake Tahoe Community College. Um, he maintains a YouTube channel that features video documentation of themed and immersive spaces from around the world. We have Joel Beckerman. <laughs> Joel is an award winning composer, producer, pioneer of sound and music, and his transformative power. He's the founder of Man Made Music, a sonic writing studio, and author of The Sonic Boom. How sound transforms the way we think, feel, and buy. Interweaving music, strategy, and popular culture, Joel is dedicated to telling compelling stories and impacting our everyday experiences with music and sound. And last, we have Gordon Grice. Gordon's an architect, editor, writer, illustrator, and creative director at Warwick in Toronto, Canada. Gordon's responsibilities include creative and art direction, creative writing, thematic development, and professional outreach. For the past two decades, Gordon has been active as a writer and editor having published more than two dozen books dealing with design and architectural illustration, um, and also contributing essays to a number of professional publications. So thank you guys for being here today and for your time. Um, did anybody receive an evaluation form when you came in? This is very important. Um, we spend a lot of time putting these sessions together, so if you please take the time to fill it out. Um, when you leave, just drop it off at the front with the ambassadors. Um, it's very helpful for us, and. Uh, very valuable feedback for us, okay? So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Uh, thank you. I mean, it's great to be here. We really enjoy doing these sessions. Uh, it gives us a chance to get together and doing the research that we thought was a lot of fun. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. We're not going to tell you how to design things, but we are hoping to share some ideas with you. And where some of these ideas I hope will be good to you, some of them will be good to you. Uh, I'm going to start off by, first of all, turning off this extraneous window. Um, we live in a visual world. There's really not much we can do about that because that's the way our brains are wired. But the uh, fact is that we're actually sentient beings. And being a sentient being means that, you, that you're open to feelings. And when you think about it, um, all of our senses are in some way an adaptation of our sense of touch. Because when you, when you see things, you get photons striking your retina. When you hear things, you have sound waves bouncing off your eardrums. Touch and taste are chemicals, molecules in the atmosphere that are interacting with sensors that are in your tongue and in your nose. So in a very, in a very real sense, we feel everything. So what I want to talk about today in particular is the way that we feel our environment. Now, Many of us in the work we do and the lives we live, uh, this is true especially with designers, we allow our visual sense to predominate over everything. So when we're designing things, for example, we're sketching, we're drawing, we're modeling, 
we're PDFing, we're Photoshopping, uh, we're doing PowerPoints. It's all in aid of the visual sense. So if there's something else going on, maybe when we're designing, we're drinking coffee, listening to music, it's all background stuff. But the fact is that our bodies are always sensitive to things other than visual. So while you think that your eyes are doing everything, in fact, there's things in the background. So not only when we design spaces, but when we experience spaces, we also use our eyes. So here's a group of people sketching what is probably the most photographed building in all of North America. This is Falling Water and Bear Run, Pennsylvania by Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, you can tell by looking at this picture already that there's a lot more going on from the visual. So what these people are recording on paper, maybe they're going to photograph it, scan it, YouTube it, Instagram it, Facebook it. That's all visual. But you can tell, you just look at the picture, there's a the sound of water, there's a the sound of rustling leaves, there's a the smell of the damper from underneath, there's your sketchy stool kind of slipping into the earth every once in a while, you have to pull it up again. <clears throat> so, one of the biggest issues, 600 years ago, a guy named Leon Battista Alberti collected all the ideas about perspective drawing and wrote them down in a book. And basically, he codified the rules for linear perspective. So since that time, 600 years ago until now, this includes every way that we perceive the environment, including photography, uh, digital modeling. It's all based on these incredible rules of linear perspective. So when this this arose in uh, 14 whatever, uh, suddenly <coughs> visual became the only way of perceiving the environment and also designing the environment. So now not only could you draw your environment, but you could draw environments that didn't even exist. So this was a huge, huge deal. However, it solidified the idea that visual was the way you deal with architecture and built environment. The fact is that although, although our visual sense occupies 30 to 40 percent of our cerebral cortex, which is a lot, um, the visual sense is spread out in various places in the brain. So it's in direct contact with all of the other senses. So while you don't realize this, every time you're looking at something, right now, you're hearing things, you're smelling things, you're feeling things, you're unaware of it. But your brain is not. It's recording these sensations. So, knowing this, that we live in a visual world, <clears throat> I decided last summer that I was going to do something called a blindfold tour. Now, has anyone here ever done a blindfold tour? You've done one. What, what city? How long was the tour? Right, and it seems like an eternity. Yeah. yeah. So I did one in Toronto, which is where I live. And right down in the heart of the city, it was a Saturday morning, so it's very busy. There's tourists, there's shoppers, there's, there's cars, trucks, domestic animals, everything, everywhere. And there I am with a blindfold, and I'm holding one end of an orange shoelace. And on the other end of the orange shoelace is the guy who's conducting the tour. So the trick was that he was going to take me through spaces that I was familiar with visually. And he was asking me to record my impressions without the visual sense. So these are the impressions that you're unaware that you're recording most of the time because you're looking. But when you can't look, then suddenly you have to pay attention to these other things. So uh, the slide on the left is the Eaton Center in downtown Toronto. The slide on the right is the Kimball Center in Fort Worth, Texas. The reason that I showing you these two slides is because they have very, very strong sensory impact. So on the left, there's the sound and the freshness of the water in the environment. So when you don't have, when you have a blindfold on and you can't see it, these are things that are very well. In the Kimball Center, which I wasn't blindfolded to experience, the sense of the, the thermal sense of the temperature of the walls on either side, the texture of the stairs as you're walking on, and even the feel of the handrail is very, very special. So this, the Kimball Arts Center by Louis Kahn has some incredible uh, sensory experiences. Most of these experiences, smell included, sound, they were kind of things that I expected to find. But the one thing that surprised 
surprised me was the sense of touch, because our sense of touch is something that we, especially ignore, especially when we're designing, we just don't think about it. Um, in particular, the sense of touch as it applies to the act of walking, because when you walk, you are always, that's how you experience the environment. And when you walk, you are in direct contact with your environment, so you can feel it beneath your feet. So this is something that Edward Mybridge observed 150 years ago. This is the very beginning of, of, of movie photography. Uh, he was more interested in the mechanics of walking. But the fact is, not only does walking put you in direct contact, physical contact with your environment, but we also, our bodies also have a system called proprioception. And proprioception, as some of you know, is the inner sense of touch. So when you start to fall over, if you, if you jump off a building and you're flying through space, your inner sense of touch says to you, oh my god, what are you doing? Because what it, does, it senses the relative position of all your musculature and your skeletal system and your body organs. It's keeping tabs of these and said, it's going, mayday, mayday, this isn't right. So when you walk, here's somebody who's just beginning to walk. When you walk, what you're doing is you're actually off balancing and then balancing again. You don't notice this because you do it all the time, but in fact, you're, you're Proprioception, your proprioceptors are, I learn all the time, but they're operating in the background. <clears throat> in situations where you can't see, there are certain ways of moving that are just not possible. So the person on the left, again, this is Edward Myers, the person on the left who's doing a back somersault, um, he could probably do it with his with his eyes closed, but you and I couldn't because we're not used to, not used to doing it because our proprioceptors are on high alert. So, here's a situation that many of us have faced. You're sitting at home, you're watching TV, playing Scrabble, reading a book, the lights go out. It's a power image. What are you going to do? Well, we usually have strategies to deal with this. We know where the candles are. We can sort of grope our way to the door. Maybe we've got a cell phone in our pocket that's got a flashlight out. Maybe we've got a headlight if we're lucky. But the main thing is, we know that there are ways that we can restore our vision in order to find our way around, because for us, it's important. But I want to construct a situation where that's unusual, where you're in a space that you're completely unfamiliar with. I don't know what you're doing there. I think maybe a client has told you that he has this beautiful space he wants you to take a look at, come up with a design for an entertainment venue. Just go and have a look at the space. Let me know what you think. So there you are in this space. Never been there before. Here we are. When suddenly, the lights go up. Now what? There you are in a space. You can't see. You don't know where you are. What's the first thing you're going to do? Can anybody suggest what the first thing you would do? You can't see. You're going to feel your way? You're going to start to grow? Any other suggestions? Phone flashlight. Phone flashlight. Good idea. Batteries did. Sorry. <laughs> you should have charged it. You meant to charge it. You didn't charge it. <laughs> so, my first suggestion is that you wait, maybe, maybe your night vision will come in. Maybe there's enough light you can see where you're going. Uh-uh, pitch black, sorry. You grope in your pockets, get your cell phone out. Good idea. But you forgot to charge it. I told you to charge it, you forgot. You dig into your visual memory. So these you're relying on. Again, you're relying on your sight always because sight is what you're seeing is what you sight is what you think you need. But your visual memory is kind of shaky. You know, you think you know where you came in, but what if you're five degrees off? You're going to wander off in some other direction. So you call for help. Now you're admitting to your helplessness. You can't see your help. You're helpless, but nobody answers. 
So now we go back to the parts of the brain that we don't normally use. You listen. Maybe there's a clue. Maybe there's a radio playing. Maybe there's traffic. Maybe there's a dog barking. Anything that could give you some clue as to what direction you should head in. You feel. You walk across the floor because now you feel. And you're like a zombie or the mummy resurrected because your hands are in front of you because you don't want to crash into things. But it's very important that you not step into a hole or trip over something. But you're feeling your way up. The last thing is, you use your sense of smell because your sense of smell can actually direct you. Smell is directional. So there's a smell of coffee coming from over there. That's a good sign. Smell of gasoline coming from over here. Better not light a match to see where I'm going. <coughs> so these are all things that you need to consider sensorially. Finally, huh, success. You find your way out of this space. You've used the background senses that you normally don't use. You come to the foreground in order to solve the problem that you need to solve and in order to feel your environment. So here, here are a couple of things I want you to keep in mind. Number one, that while you're busy looking at things, your other senses are engaged whether you know it or not. Two, if you're a designer, you can take advantage of these other things. When you're putting something into it, don't just think visually. Think sensorially. Because if you don't, other sensations will come into play that you have no control over, and they may not reinforce the environment that you're trying to create. So think about these things. If you want to be an immersive designer, think about what immersion means. The last one, obviously, is a sense of touch, which is often overlooked. I like to say that. If you're being a designer, think of yourself as a choreographer. Think of how people actually move through space. Not just what they see, but how they actually move. So there's a couple of examples. Um, so uh, we recently designed a maze park. And one of the things in the maze park, I talked about this last year, actually. One of the parts of the maze park was a, a water maze park. And this is an example of a water maze in Lima, Peru. And uh, the trick of water is that it's an extremely tactile material. Not only do you feel it physically, but there's a thermal quality, there's the mist that kind of washes over you, and of course there's the sound of water splash, which is a comforting sound. Another space that many of you will be familiar with, the Highline in New York, which is special because like a theme park, it lifts you out of your everyday experience. So you're treated to smells, that you wouldn't put in the city, so instead of off the moves the road. Thank you. Uh, there's also thermal quality. Instead of heat rising off the pavement, you've got a nice breeze blowing on you. It's a very, very special uh, heterotopia that exists, a space outside of space that exists in New York City. I want to show you this because as an architect, I was instructed always that what I want to create is spaces that are safe, that are efficient, that are comfortable, and if possible, pleasant. So when you're in the theme park business, you have access to something that most architects do not have access to, and that's the appropriate part of touch. So here are a bunch of people who are anything but comfortable. These people are extremely uncomfortable, and their proprioceptors are going crazy. They're loving it. So that's why I think that designing theme parks is the best job for an architect, because you don't have to make people comfortable, and they're really happy that you didn't make them comfortable. <laughs> Last thing, virtual and augmented reality. <coughs> These aspects are taking over are assuming the responsibility for creating immersive environments. In fact, a lot of times when you talk about immersive environments, people assume you're talking about virtual reality because now virtual and augmented reality can cover all of the senses, including touch and smell. So for us, I think as designers, it's important to protect reality as much as we can. We should embrace this technology, but we should never abandon actual physical reality. <coughs> the last thing is that we hear a lot about sensory overload. We're constantly bombarded with inputs, sound, information, aromas, 
things we don't need. So we seek ways to alleviate that. So when we're walking in the city, we got earbuds in our ears. When we're going to buy food, it's all blister pack, so we don't have to smell it. Maybe, you know, maybe some food doesn't smell so good. We design buildings, it's all about glass and steel, nothing harsh. What I'm saying is that you need to feel the environment. You need to be up here. You need to take the earbuds and just listen to the sounds of the city. Go to an Asian market, a spice market. Find out what it really feels like to have different kinds of smells. And I'm not talking about the perfume department and the department store. That's one thing. I'm talking about actual smells. And I think that if you expose yourself, you feel the environment, you expose yourself to the environment, it will make you a better designer. So that's what I'd like to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Gordon, for uh, providing the talk. Um, by the way, you may have noticed when you walked in today, there are some on your table. Uh, just about a little bit of excitement later, those will uh, come into play, but please don't know them yet, so we'll, we'll get to those after uh, Joel's talk. So, uh, and I want to thank you all for coming today. It's a real pleasure to uh, speak to you. Um, today I'll be talking about specifically uh, the senses of smell and taste and how these connect to experience, and particularly the experience of the guest, whether it's in a museum, a theme park, or uh, an interpretive center, and so forth. Um, so, uh, Gordon was talking about um, the experiences of guests being underwhelmed, maybe in some sensory senses. Uh, so, I wanted to mention uh, the work of Marcel Proust, who, of course, is a famous writer, who very well know his work, remembrance of things past, and draw attention to this quote in particular When nothing else subsists from the past, after the things are broken and scattered, the smell and taste of things remain poised a long time like souls, bearing resiliently on tiny and almost impalpable drops of their essence, the immense edifice of memory. Uh, if you know Proust's work, he, of course, uh, instituted our understandings of how sensory appeals or sensory uh, stimuli in an environment can trigger memory. Uh, and it's a really great story that he retells in his great seven-volume work where he's eating a very simple thing, a little cookie or a piece of cake, basically, dipping that into a cup of tea. And he describes the situation as one of shuddering. This memory, this, this moment of memory comes back to him somehow uh, from the past. And uh, it's all because of this, this uh, sensorial aspect of dipping the cookie in the tea, the smell, and the taste of it all. And so if you think about uh, Proust and his work on memory, we might actually recall that memory, uh, the etymology, the meaning of memory, uh, involves not just the idea of recollection, which is, I think, the meaning we often think of, but it also involves anxiety and sadness. And so I think he indicates that with memory and with the senses, it's not necessarily that positive things are going to uh, be recalled when you have a sensory uh, experience in the space. And indeed, if you're designing for an interpretive center, if you're doing work, say, on genocide or dark history, or what we call dark theming, you may want to use sensory stimuli in an environment to recall less positive memories. But all the while, they are hopefully putting the guests um, in the space. I'll talk about this in a second, but one of the things that happens is, of course, uh, the use of the senses and the memories that they may recall are subjective, and cultural anthropologists talk about the idea of an emic perspective. And an emic perspective is what we call the insider's perspective. So how each and every one of you today is experiencing this talk, how each and every one of you will experience going to the trade hall, seeing the, the latest VR rides, having those little mini donuts, which you had, if you haven't had the mini donuts, the mini donuts. And maybe have your own Christian moment uh, of memory. But anthropologists try to remind us that it's so important to try to get inside the head of the individual, of the guest, subjectively within a space. Um, so moving to uh, smell, to the olfactory sense, and ambiance, uh, I will point to this uh, quote by Lush here. And how many of you right now can recall a smell memory of Lush Cosmetics? Have you ever walked by? Quite a few people. I think it's very distinctive. And this quote is then reminiscent of, of maybe that experience. Uh, the next time you smell something that immediately brings you back to a certain time in your life, linger there for a moment. Who needs a time machine when your nose can be the key? 
key to a transcendent nostalgic moment. Smelling is believing. And so Lush, I think, very effectively has connected smell, perhaps down the road if you visit another Lush shop, you have that memory moment, and thus it's, it's really get us, getting us into experience and perception of the guest who walks into that store. Uh, indeed, there's been a lot of research done. There are entire groups of uh, schools of anthropological thought that focuses on sensory studies. Uh, there's also uh, ample literature on the subject, everything from the book Love Marks to uh, Brand Sense, focuses on some of the amazing brand and uh, spatial connections that we can make uh, with using the senses. And Martin Lindstrom says here that research has shown a 40% improvement in our mood when we're exposed to a pleasant fragrance, particularly if the fragrance taps into a joyful memory. Uh, and I've highlighted joyful and pleasant here because this really gets us into the, uh, the, 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 the thick, I think, of sensory experiences and the fact that sensory experiences often are subjective. And so therefore, that's the challenge of approaching the use of the senses, connecting those to memory, connecting those to experience, say, within the realm of a museum or a theme park. So it's no easy matter. I think that's something we'll maybe walk away with today. Um, connecting that, that sense of smell more to the brand, uh, we can look at a series of studies, and one in particular said that uh, only the sense of smell can connect to the three important aspects of retailing, arousal, pleasure, and overall satisfaction. Now, I'm not advocating that smell is any better than any of the other senses, and we'll, I think, talk about today, and we'll do a little uh, activity later, that focuses on how we can combine the senses in some powerful ways that they work together in a holistic sense. Clearly, though, we should say that smell is a key sense in terms of recalling things like memory, as Bruce talked about, creating ambiance and atmosphere and theme in immersive spaces, establishing the identity of the brand and the space, and also connecting the guests to experiences, whether they're pleasant or unpleasant experiences. Now, in the case of another smell here, how many of you right now can have a, a memory, a smell memory of Abercrombie and Fish? Many more people, and there's, okay, so there's, I hear little gasps and sounds, and maybe we won't get into what that means, but maybe uh, you have a strong connection to that, to that scent, fierce. You can see here there are some folks protesting uh, the scent. I, I, I can't understand why they would, but maybe some of you can. So, uh, you know, this particular blog that this uh, story comes from is telling the story of the goodbye to the uh, uh, smell of fierce in the AF stores, and this person is sort of sad about this happening. Uh, you know, there's tradition here, it's part of the brand identity. And anytime someone changes their brand identity, if you remember the gap fiasco years ago, the logo switch, which I think graphic designers were horrified when, when that gap logo switch happened and they switched back. But in the case of uh, this connection between the brand and the scent uh, fierce, which is to hum through the stores, I think people have a lot of opinions. And understandings, and I think this may explain maybe why they switched to Elwood uh, and and two other scents. So this is a study done by Fordham University in 2014, and they're specifically trying to connect uh, our senses of smell and our perceptions of space. And there's two types of spaces we could talk about: a crowded space, uh, and the theory is that in a crowded space, maybe like in one of the crowded and dark A and F stores. People want um, to perceive something that's a more open scent um, in an empty space. So a space that is devoid of people, a space maybe that is you know, outdoors or has a, you know, a feel of an agora, an open space, people prefer more of a closed scent. So what I've done is just charted that here, open space and closed space. Um, and again, we might associate open space with uh, feelings or notions of, of expansiveness and freedom in the outdoors, a closed space might be more uh, enclosed, confined, and indoors. And then uh, on the left there, we have then the sense that according to the study would be perceived as um, better or more viable or pleasurable for the guests in that space. Um, so in the case, again, of an open space, we should avoid the open scent. An open scent might be something connoting the outdoors, uh, trees, apples, uh, coconut, and so forth. So for that space, we should actually go for, according to the study, a closed scent. For example, firewood, popcorn, or musk. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of uh, if you've been to uh, Dennis Seaver's house uh, in, in London, 
Gordon's uh, been there. Uh, it's a very evocative multi-sensory space, and one of the things they do very effectively there is they light fires and have smell <laughs> part of the overall immersive sensation. And you have to walk through that particular space in silence. So it's an incredible multi-center space that I recommend you all visit. Now, the, the next, uh, this column here gets to, I think, the, the situation in the uh, a and stores. So if it's a closed space, and most people would say a store like Abercrombie & Fitch is dark, maybe it's a bit foreboding as you walk in. Um, and by the way, retail spaces, I don't think there's been enough research done on how retail spaces themselves are evocative of immersive spaces. I recently did a research study of some of the amazing boutiques in Portland, Oregon, and I was particularly amazed to see just how they develop the spaces in, in terms of material culture, brands, and so forth. Um, we often think of those spaces only through the products, but we should think of them as think, fully immersive spaces. So in the case of the ANF store, the um, movement away from fears suggests that perhaps, because it is, a uh, closed space, they're moving more towards an open scent. Um, and in that new scent, uh, the Elwood, it has musk, which according to the chart here, is a closed scent, but they balance it with citrus, right? Citrus is, connotes the outdoors, and citrus is so important to Florida. You go to Disney Springs, you see a lot of citrus there used as part of the backstory a little bit. Uh, so this suggests maybe the reason for changing was to try to get away from some of the perceptions that people had with that particular scent um, at their stores. Uh, just very briefly on taste today, the idea of touch points. Uh, a lot of people would say that taste is a very underused sense in experiential spaces, also in branding. Uh, some studies out there have said that less than 20% of the popular brands out there actually leverage the sense of taste. And we might ask why this is the case. And in your future, if you, I don't know, get involved in any kind of Activities, maybe even the seminar today, you might think about uh, how taste could be used uh, in a hypothetical theme for immersive space. We could think about the five senses, and by the way, uh, other cultures out there perceive more than five senses. We're using five for this sense of discussion today. But you could think about the, the distance of perception, so if there's a sound in the back of the room, uh, maybe I can hear that before I can see something. Uh, when you get into the sense of taste, it's the closest to us. Typically, I have to taste something in my mouth, right, to have a sensibility about it. And that's, I think, one of the challenges of using taste. Uh, how many of you have been to a Linnea restaurant in Chicago? No one's been there. You have to go there. Please, if you go to Chicago, go to Linnea. It's worth the $400 price. I, I kid you not. Uh, one of the best restaurant in the world years ago, uh, Brian Atkins, who's an inspirational chef, if you know his story about dealing with uh, tongue cancer and everything, but what he does so effectively there is creates a multi-sensorial experience for the guests. Uh, literally every sense is used, and not just taste. Taste is the obvious one. And even when he uses taste, he plays tricks on your mind, which is the point of molecular gastronomy. So when I was eating there, I was eating a grape, and lo and behold, I was actually eating salmon. It was a grape that tasted like salmon. And so there's all kind of tricks that he plays, almost in the sense that a performance artist or a conceptual artist will try to play with our senses in a museal space or an installation or something like that. Uh, the sense of touch is utilized because the all the silverware, all the accoutrements for the amazing food, you actually touch that. The seats themselves are custom designed for the restaurant. Walking into the space, you have this amazing experience where literally you're walking down a dark hall and the door opens uh, automatically and you're thrown into the restaurant. And so what Atkins is doing at Olivia is doing something very performative and conceptual. And I really want to suggest that if you're using the senses, I think we can avoid that easy moment, the scratch and sniff, say, for smell, or you go into a, a museum, and maybe there's something that says, uh, you know, turn this dial and you smell cinnamon. That's OK. That's certainly OK. That's the first step. But if we approach what someone like Atkins is doing in a very performative and conceptual sense, that's when we can affect the guest at levels of memory, at levels that are almost, I would say, existential in nature. So I, I really would leave you with that. And I want to um, mention our article and, and leave you with this quote here. Uh, if you haven't picked up a copy, in addition to eating the mini donuts today in the trading hall, um, please pick up a copy of Attractions Management by IAPA Central. And uh, the three of us wrote this article talking about the census, so more of the ideas can be explored there. And I will leave you with this quote today uh, as an opportunity to collaborate and to, 
to combine the senses, uh, we should note that the senses should never be considered in isolation from one another. As we think about effective sensory design, we should remember to leverage the power of one sense to impact another, with the overall effect being the greater immersion of the guest in the space in question. I thank you very much for your time, and I'll pass it on to you. So uh, I'm here to talk about, about sound and music and sort of its role in our lives. So there's a, there are a number of peculiar things about music and sound that are, you know, and, and, and I, I guess our, our sense of hearing that are a little bit different. So uh, again, I think to Gordon's point, much of the music and sound in our lives, and really primarily, primarily almost most of the sound, we're not even necessarily always aware that it's there, that it operates at this subconscious level. So first of all, I want to apologize to everybody. Once you start talking about all this multi-sensory stuff, you're not going to see your world or hear your world or smell your world or sense your world the same way. Uh, we've been having these conversations in preparation for this talk about how we're sort of maniacally looking at experiences and sort of tearing them apart and putting back together again. Um, and, and sound in particular is, is one of those senses that again, we don't, we're not really aware uh, of the fact that essentially every single moment of our lives is scored by music and sound. It is this hidden actor in our lives that is guiding our choices, changing our mood, and making and breaking emotional connections that we have with people, places, and things every single second of our lives. <laughs> So if there are any parents in the room, especially, any of us, actually, uh, the sound of a baby cry is the sound that we all respond most viscerally to. And actually, it's a really good thing. Survival of the species, right? Just like uh, we think about uh, ancient man when they heard a twig snap, it was actually incredibly important that all our senses, when we heard that, and all of our senses were guided to see what was behind that bush so we could determine whether that was lunch or we were about to become lunch. So sound, again, has this really, really interesting role in our lives and then it guides all our other senses and it draws our attention to specific senses. So everyone knows Mary Poppins, right? Lovely childhood children's character, very uh, warm and friendly, a spoonful of sugar, no, not somebody else. Now, the, the, the point of the movie was this was the ideal babysitter, right? So when you hear something a little different in association with the visuals, Mary Poppins becomes something just a bit different. Um, one of the things that, so I'm a composer, I do a lot of different kinds of scoring. 
But I learned early on when I was working in horror in particular that if you have the music bump and the and the and the and the, the sound actually hit on the scare, you would blow the entire gag in the horror movie. Actually, the sound needs to come, sound and music needs to come just a little bit late because you need to actually register the visuals of what you're seeing first and then have the sound come slightly thereafter so that your sort of sensory input hits in the brain at the exact same time. Also, when you're thinking about the role of sound in attractions, think about what we call sonic semiotics. Everyone knows what semiotics are visually, right? You look at a stop sign and there's a certain color and there's a little white border around it and it's, you know, even from a very, uh, a very, very distance, just from the shape of the sign, you know what that sign is. So there are a lot of visual semiotics you're familiar with. There's also sonic semiotics. So strings, in general, in music, and listen, this is a, a bit of a gross generalization, but this is mostly true. Strings, in generally, in music and sound, especially in film music and in attractions, tend to uh, denote emotions like warmth, scale. Moments 
of the music and sound might become a little bit more mid-ground. But the way this you experience in the space, you can still have conversations. It's not meant to constantly be in your face and constantly be dragging and having your attention. Some of the more active parts, but there's some much more subtle parts. You'll hear even just that there are uh, crickets in the background in the cartoon sphere. And again, that was a big part of trying to match some of the sound from the other areas. So sonic truths, these are the things. If you walk away with three things to think about in terms of how you utilize music and sound and attractions, experiences, and in brand experiences. First of all, it's not about the sound. It's about the experiences that we're creating. I'm a musician. I'm a composer. I love music. But I'm in service of the overall experience. It's not about that music and sound. A lot of times people will say, well, this is music that I love, and so it should be blaring. No, no, that's not, that's not creating great experiences. Think about the role of the film composer. Film composers, what film composers do is we, we look at music and sound in service of telling the story moment to moment. Most of the film score, uh, you don't even know what it's doing to the film unless it's gone. If you take the music and sound out of the film, you don't understand how much it's doing to the film. Second thing is to use music and sound strategically. So what do I mean by you know, strategically? It's purposefully. It's trying to think about, you really need to back out uh, of the aesthetic and creative part of it, part of your mind. It's a very, very left and right brain exercise. And think about, what am I trying to accomplish? What do I want people to feel moment to moment? Where are the moments I need to give them a break for music and sound? The apparent the appearance of silence. By the way, there's no such thing as silence. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and, and really, the, the, the next thing is, what role can music and sound help to sort of drive that multi-sensory component we're talking about? So, so that sometimes maybe music and sound is, is, is more leading and sometimes it's more following in those experiences. But to think about it strategically, what are your objectives moment to moment in the story and how can music and sound serve that? Third thing is silence is our white space in design. One of the things that I would say in attractions that freak people out the most is when we're taking music and sound out of experiences. What well, other you guys are the music and sound guys? Why are we taking everything? The answer is because without, everyone knows in design, without white space, you have chaos. Silence is the white space in the music and sound uh, design area. And without ample white space, we're just completely, I mean, I'm sure everyone have been through experiences before where the sound is just overwhelming front to back. And without those contrasts, without those moments of white space, apparent white space, uh, we're really not creating great experiences. We might be overwhelming people, we might be stimulating all their senses, but that's not creating memorable experiences for people. So uh, just one more thing about silence. There is no such thing as silence. There is, if you go into an anechoic chamber, which is maybe one of the places on, on the planet where there truly is silence, it's actually unnerving because we are constantly attuned to trying to listen to the sounds in our, our environment. And when there's no sound in your environment, what happens? You start hearing your own sounds, your heartbeat, and, and your blood rushing through your veins. And if you sit in there long enough, you start hearing the electrical, electrical activity in your brain, believe it or not. So it's very, very unnerving. So don't think that when I say silence, I mean literal silence. It's really the perception of silence, which often is just a contrast from loud music and sound. Sometimes it's just a question of something that's extremely quiet and subtle and more tasteful in those moments. So quickly, the future of music and sound and experiences. And this is like, these are the places where we're really looking and trying to uh, explore and, and something I invite you all to look at and explore as well. First is massive multi-channel 3D spatialized audio. Right now, what do you have? Generally, you have vehicles with speakers behind your head. That's not bad. But what about if we had more of like an IMAX theater type of sound in, uh, in large scale attractions? What are the opportunities even in a, a waiting area for real large scale spatialized audio, 3D spatialized audio. Why does my attention have to be forward in, in a uh, in, in sort of a theatrical way? Why can't I have experiences surrounding me? We're doing this now work, you know, this type of work in VR and AR, but why not also in spaces? 
Second thing we're thinking about is artificial intelligence. How can soundtracks shift and morph dynamically? So this, this has been in, in existing in, in, in uh, video games for, for decades. Uh, why not bring that kind of thinking, uh, really decision trees, which may affect audio and soundscapes, which essentially can, you know, is driving story and decision trees uh, through the use of artificial intelligence. That's another area we're playing. And the third is really the in thinking about the sort of integration of multiple touch points across a large scale. You, everyone knows now that the experiences you have in theme parks and other kinds of places, they don't just exist in the actual ride and attraction uh, by itself. There are pre-shows. There are often now post-shows. Sometimes music and sound can be used as a, as a memory trigger. We were talking about memory triggers before in terms of reminding you what a great experience you had later in digital, in terms of apps, in terms of uh, looking at other ways that we're connecting consumers and things like retail stores. Why should the retail store soundtrack be disassociated from the ride and the experience? There's ways to tie those things together across touch points. So those are the places I, uh, that we're looking to play and looking to sort of improve uh, guest experiences and places I suggest you consider as well. So, quick sum up, because um, we're going to put you guys all to work. That little envelope is about to explain in just a moment. But what I want to, when we're talking about everything we talked about today, if you only walked away with four general ideas, these are the things we'd like you to think about. Think multi-sensory at the inception. If your concepts and your ideas at the beginning include multi-sensory thinking, you will be successful in the things that the three of us have been talking about today. If you try to add multi-sensory layers later, it, it almost never works. Second, think about a creative systems brain trust. We all know how important it is for creative and systems to get along in attractions. It's nowhere, it's nowhere, nowhere is that more important than in multi-sensory experiences that we're trying to create. What is possible in terms of systems at the beginning of a project, uh, it, there are many, many more possibilities than there are uh, after things have already been baked. We know this. So it's really, really important uh, in multi-sensory experiences to be thinking about that. Third is to think about creating powerful and efficient experiences. What do we mean by efficient? Efficient is maybe not stimulating all the senses all the time. Maybe it's not about uh, maximalism. Maybe there's an opportunity, very, very simply, with, with, a, a, uh, with, with a, a small sensory cue to really advance a story without uh, thinking about the sort of uh, kitchen sink approach to multi-sensory. So we think about creating powerful but efficient experiences in multi-sensory. And the fourth thing, which we're all going to practice right now, and I want to suggest that you think about, is making sonic mood boards part of your brief. So we're going to talk about a sonic mood board in a second. Um, I'll tell you what, why don't you, uh, why don't you all open up the envelope that's there. There's uh, identical pieces of paper for everyone at your table. Everyone should get one copy of what's inside your envelope. This is your multi-sensory design challenge. Can we turn the lights up a little bit, please? So we're asking you, you're only going to have 10 minutes to do this, OK? It's a rapid fire assignment, OK? Um, think about the anniversary of the, moon, the first moon shot, OK? That's what we're going to ask you to think about. And I'm going to talk more about this in a second, but let, let, me, let me share with you some music and sound that I hope will inspire you. So I'm talking about sonic mood boards. Think about the story points that are available when you're talking about moonshot, moon landings.
So, think about those emotional story points that all I think would appear potentially in a moonshot story in a, in a, in a, uh, in an attraction environment. What else can you gentlemen, uh, so you're, you're, let me, let me just tell you, the outcome we're looking for, you can look at the piece of paper for additional information, but the outcome we're looking for, really, there, there are three deliverables listed there. Get to the deliverables if you can, but the most important thing in the next 10 minutes is we want you to come up with between three and seven key storytelling moments that you can tell through your design choices about what you're gonna do with this assignment. Okay? So think about if a visitor was going to come, what might be the three to seven key storytelling moments that you can create as designers for this experience? Uh, you can start work right away. Uh, my job here as creative director is to give you some inspiration. One thing I want you to know is that in the creative process, and there's research to support this, when you have constraints, you are active, your creative mind is actually more active. There's nothing deadlier than a blank page. So when you have constraints that you have to work with, you already have a kickstart for the creative process. And the other thing is that we find that when you're creating an immersive environment, uh, if you have already elements within, within the site that you're creating with, and you can work with those elements, you have the capacity to create something that's truly unique because the elements you're working with aren't unique to that site. They might be physical elements, they might be cultural, historic, political, any kind of elements, but it means that you're creating an experience that you couldn't create anywhere else. So I want you to think about those things. Oh, the other constraint, by the way, is deadline. Don't you love deadlines? So you've got a 10 minute deadline. I've got short nine minutes, nine, nine, 15 seconds. And real brief, and real brief uh, please work collaboratively so uh, whatever um, part of the industry you represent, everyone in the group needs to work together. Please um, synthesize your ideas. We will be around to help you out if you need to do that. Okay, so everyone should have a leader at the table to here to talk about your final recommendations for your experience. If I get your attention now, if I get your attention now, everybody, that'd be great. Okay, so. I have a little, a little surprise for you. Not everyone has the same design constraints as you. Okay? Different people have different design constraints. Raise your, raise your hand if you're a number one, which is Harvard. Okay? Those folks, they had their constraint was around the location being a harbor. Uh, raise your hand if you were number two, the abandoned mall. Okay? These folks, their design constraint was around an abandoned mall. Who had the ghost town? Okay, these are ghost town people here. And then who has the abandoned airport terminal? Okay, the number four is over here. Okay, so let's start with number four. Um, who wants to uh, raise your hand if you are a leader at your table? Great. Could you tell us what, what did you guys come up with? And I have a microphone for you here as we're, as we're talking. Okay, sure. Uh, so uh, our... Uh, and we're, just so everyone knows, we're a little tight for time, so we're going to try to get through these pretty quick. So our challenge was uh, to base a uh, theme park on the anniversary of the moon landing in an abandoned airport terminal. So some of the things we came up with were the actually landing on the moon, so simulating the um, descent and touchdown on the moon, walking on the moon, um, maybe a G-force simulator where you can walk out onto the spacecraft through the, through the gateway of the terminal having um, a NASA space station or mission control be an interactive experience uh, for people maybe uh, having astronaut food, uh, Apollo theme film score, a triumphant and accomplishment theme music, or maybe also kind of sad remembrance music for a hall of remembrance for the people who you know worked on this and some of the people who uh, sacrificed a lot for this and some people who sacrificed lives. Um, uh, maybe an area to understand the competition of space exploration um, in the kids' areas like moon, soft foam, um, moon to the area, and stuff. So. Cool, so you had a lot of experience to find. Hold on a minute for a second, I have a couple of questions. So, how did multi sensory enter into your consideration set when you were thinking about these appearances, or did it? Well, the biggest thing uh, was beyond the touch and the sight was the sound. There wasn't really much smell because the biggest thing is there's no atmosphere in space, so nobody knows what 
there isn't really a perceived smell, so I guess we didn't think about it. But if we had put, we could have put kind of, we could have just not. I guess what we did. Ask for not ice cream? I don't know, we'll talk about it. Um, thank you guys very much. Okay. Some additional thoughts? Let's give it up. Okay. Additional thoughts? Anything new, anything different than these? So, right, in regards to new, we thought we could all start in the training facility where uh, you would go through some tests, like a water feature, for example, a submersion feature, and depending on those trainings, you'd then get a role. So you could either be an astronaut or go to mission control, and so you'd sort of be split up into these experiences. One of the things we talked about uh, was a suit that the astronauts would wear. We thought the suit could be a vehicle to have a bunch of sensory experiences. For example, when you step onto the moon, uh, noise cancellation within the suit, and then an occasional triggering of talking to mission control, and then vastness of sound. And so, you know, we thought there's different ways to do that, sort of interactive components. And we did think that the moon smells like cheese. <laughs> Um, we thought, well, we saw the big open space and beginning, like, kind of a rival. It's open, it's light, but the darker areas we thought would be more like the moon and mission control would also be dark. A lot of background noise, a lot of chatter, like, there's a lot of activity going on. Oh, that's cool. So you're utilizing the darkness to help you. How about you guys? Anything, anything else to add? Yeah, so we've got, um, a thing that came to mind really quickly with the space travel was sort of the emotional impact of it, and just, like, what kind of risk they were taking, and sort of the, uh, the aspiration of it. So we thought that it we can start off with uh, Kennedy's quote where he's saying, she's going to the moon, uh, because it's not like it. uh, And then because the Air Force Terminal already has been like a solid scope and like a big figure in each sort of old terminal can be a branch. Oh, you see the architecture, that's yeah. really cool. Um, and you know, this tower, which is kind of obvious that they're going to kind of experience, um, um, like the idea of like, uh, exploring the moon rover. Awesome, thank you so much. Let's give it up for these guys. So I think we thought of it as a very kind of linear experience where you get to be the astronaut first and then you get to be the American doing it second. So doing what they kind of said where you go to your training, you have some G-force, you have a lot of kind of really immersive things with rides to, to train to be the astronaut and then take the rocket ship. So like you get a little, a little bit of a earning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then um, when you get there, you get to do what they did on the moon. So if it's some, it's some kind of, I know, anti gravity you know, kind of out there, but something like a bungee simulation, and you feel like you're hopping on the moon, oh, you get to play, cool. you know, golf, you plant the flag, those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, and then we wanted to do something to do with sort of sensory deprivation to make you feel the isolation in space. So some sort of a dark infinity room with kind of just a little bit of twinkling lights and no sound whatsoever. Awesome. Make you feel that. But when you exit, then you walk into sort of a 1960s rough, the nuclear family living room where you have the old TV set, you have you know the broadcaster you know explaining it, and you have JFK and all of that. You get to experience it as the American, and you get the hopefulness there. So. Oh, cool! So you're getting sort of the 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 the, the, the country behind you sort of piece of it. Let's give it up for these guys. Um, a lot of the same or similar ideas to what we've already heard, but we also, one that sort of stood out to us, um, I think was using that anticipation of queuing and the anxiety associated with prepping for a launch into outer space, and then the launch itself being in a tight, cramped, very loud, very ocean-filled, probably smells that it might not be normal for us, um, from that to, uh, to the able to yeah. um, what smells did you guys imagine? What were you thinking about in terms of smell? We didn't get into a lot of detail of that, but in my mind, I mean, I figured that a launch ship got to be the engine fuel and the smoke and then all you know, of that. Um, and you go from that to it, again, like I said, the, the nothingness. The sure, yeah, the attention. And, uh, and that iconic view of Earth from, uh, from outer space. Cool. Uh, Thank you so much. Give it up for this group. Students, okay. So these guys are all looking for work, just let you know. Um, so you guys have the ghost town. Who's speaking on behalf of your table? Great. Oh, 
Um, so we were planning on uh, having two themed zones um, because we see that this ghost town has uh, a street with lots of buildings and then also a lot of empty um, desert-like area which would be great for seeming like you're on the moon. So there's the on the moon area and then there is an in-town area. Uh, the town would be themed um, to the time period when the moon landing occurred. So we were thinking of having a diner um, and also there would be a parade there and celebratory music. Um, in the town, uh, we would have, uh, well on the moon area, we would have a moonwalk attraction, um, some kind of uh, puzzle escape room type thing where you have to use tools with the astronaut suit, um, and a, uh, a gravitron type ride, um, and also a slingshot and some kitty rockets. Cool, I love how you guys used uh, everything around. So listen, um, we are a little tight on time. I'm gonna ask every group to maybe just give us one headline of something you want to add to the to the uh, assignment here that maybe was unique to your group. So, how, who's the leader of the table? Great. Can you just tell us one thing that you guys agreed yeah, on? The first thing we agreed on is we needed more than nine minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was more of us than you guys. So we kind of disrupted your whole plan. We decided to take a ghost town theme and talk about a colonization after colonization of what happens. Hey guys, if we can just keep. Keep it down so we can hear everything she's saying, that'd be great. So it was uh, the, the theme, the overall statement is Revelation, those before us, the new moon. So we're talking about taking the whole theme of the ghost town that you were walking through and literally the path morphs and changes, sights, smells, sounds, as it changes slowly into a moon environment that you walk through. Ooh, cool, I love that. That's a great idea. Um, you guys have one quick thing to add? I'm not going to get to everybody, guys. I'm so sorry. Um, so we were thinking all the lines that with the ghost town also being on the frontier of the west back then, there's also a comparable with then the space race and the frontier of space. So there's very good amount of culture and the technology and watching all the things that this group. Excellent. Let's give it up to these guys. I'm going to go to the next uh, town, Van and Mall. Can you, what, what, let's stick, let's stick to what do you think was different about doing this with an abandoned mall that led you to some point that would be helpful for everyone else to, to hear about? Well, I'd have to say that we were more, not terribly intentional in our <laughs> use of the abandoned mall. Okay. We never discussed that. But I think we naturally, <laughs> but I think we naturally thought in terms of rooms and smaller places. So we thought about a big experience, and we thought about a couple of medium-sized experiences, and then we thought about much smaller experiences that could be in the smaller spaces. And our overarching theme was one small step for man. So we we're currently looking at what's one small step you can take so we keep you moving. Oh, super cool. So that became the theme was the one small step. That's fantastic. Um, so let's grab somebody with a different design challenge. Or you guys also had them all. Excuse me one second. Um, just we're out of time. They're giving us the wrap up. Who in the harbor wants to talk? Can you give us some, some kind of a sense of Something that's different that came out of the harbor? Well, with uh, the harbor, definitely from, um, uh, we had some challenges with them on what to do with the space. But the three things that we came up with was using the dock area for some type of blast off experience. So they got to experience the, the fuel, the smoke, the heat, uh, especially. Uh, and also utilizing like how do you duplicate or replicate the experience of being uh, on the moon. So it's a, an underwater immersion, something where you could tie into the weightlessness and the uh, lack of sound, etc. So great. So literally using the water. Using the water. That's fantastic. Part of the experience. Okay. One last one last note. We'll do a quick wrap up. You guys got something? We had a couple, we were in the harbor as well, but having some uh, themed areas, the same as in the launch pad, and then you can have a reading room area with the ride that would go into the water, like the capsule was reading room. Uh, rides, we would have the VR dark ride that involved the launching, you know, return and all that, and the G Force ride, the drop ride with your G Force, and then we wanted a restaurant in there, and actually we'll call it Transfer Bay, sort of freeze dry foods. And nice. And all that stuff. Nice. Sometimes you have to work in and find space with a little bit of body. Great. Hey, everyone, give yourselves a round of applause. Sorry.
very convenient to leave that to everybody, but they are kind of giving us the, the, the sign that it's time to wrap up. Scott and Gord, if you guys can just tell us what things you heard were the most remarkable that you felt that uh, you wanted to wrap up with. Oh, uh, well, I, I just, I mean, we're really short time, so I just appreciate the creativity and the openness and the fact that some of you talked about multi-sensory components, role-playing, moods, remembrance, and so just, you know, great job all the time. Yeah, great job, great job using the multi-sensory ideas, guys, that seem like a bit trigger some ideas. Anything you want to wrap up with, Gord? Yeah, there are two things, and I think the whole discussion of smell was great. Somebody said, one of, the, one of the tables said, well, it doesn't smell in outer space. True, but in a space capsule, well, I mean, seriously. <laughs> uh, so I thought that was good. And then the other one about going through the dark passage, getting into the launch capsule where everything is so intimate, so you've got smells, you've got sounds, you've got God knows what, and then suddenly, contrast, outer space. So this is a real, this is an architectural thing when you go through a confined space and then you get into a broad space. But in this particular example, it's an extreme example. So I thought that was that. Yeah. You all did a great job. Thanks so much for being here. Really appreciate